You guys with me? Good morning. Today is my anniversary. Yeah. Woo. Fired up. Where's that gorgeous girl? Wearing my favorite color. Awesome. Awesome. Happy anniversary, baby. Okay. Today we're talking about being renewed. And y'all buckle up, buttercup, because this is a doozy. I am so excited to talk about this and, and what it's, what's going to happen by the end of today. It's just so many surprises, so much cool stuff. And I thank you guys for being here. By a show of hands, how many people have ever been to a public library and checked out a book? Okay, all right. How many people have ever been to a public library and checked out a book but accidentally kept it too long? Okay, all right. Did you ever come across two glorious words called late fees? Yes, yes. Or blockbuster video. Anybody remember that? Man, that was a hot date on a Friday night for me and Amy. That's how we made it 23 years. We could go pick up Operation Dumbo Drop, the DVD, and get it, and know that we had two whole days to watch it until we forgot about it. And the late fee's coming. By the time you're, you find it under the seat of the car, you bought it. It just sends you an invoice, $29.95. No DVD costs that. There was a lady... And her name was, I think it was Emily. Is it in here? Emily Sims. Oh, God bless Emily Sims. She went to the Kiwani Public Library in Illinois in the year 1955. Remember that. April of 1955. She went to check out this book of poetry from this library. This is the Kiwani Public Library. It's a real thing. You know, I'm not making it up. And she goes to check it out. Now, when she goes to check this out, the book is due back April 19th. 1955. <laughs> Y'all know where this is going, don't you? Now, the incentive wasn't very high for her to return it on time because the late fees back in 1955 were two cents. Two cents per day. Well, who could, I mean, you know, well, maybe back then that was worth something. But today, we laugh at that, right? And apparently Emily did too because she forgot about the book for a while. And by a while, I mean 47 years. <laughs> 47 years, she's going to her mom's house, who was still alive, and she went, and she was digging through some stuff. She goes, oh my goodness, that's my poetry book. Now, I don't know if Emily was a Christian or just a really honest girl, but she gathers her book and her checkbook and heads back to the Kiwani Public Library to do the right thing and return it. She doesn't leave quite as wealthy as she came. Even though it was just two cents a day, the check she had to write, the Kiwani Public Library, came up to $345.14 at two cents a day. 47 years of late fees. Now here's what's sad. All of that could have been avoided if she just renewed the book. If she just had renewed it, just checked it out again. Say, I'm not done with this. I'd like to keep it 48 more years and go away with it. <laughs> but she didn't do that. She did not renew this as she should have periodically. Oh, church, I'm going somewhere with this. Some of you get it. I see four light bulbs going off right now uh, that, that you know where I'm going with this. When you hear the word renewal, what do you think of? For me, I'm going to be honest, I don't like the word. Because I'm always thinking of a landlord who comes and says, it's time to renew your lease. Right? Whether it's a house or a building or whatever, because you know the lease is going up. You know it is. Yes, it is. Even though you don't want it to. Read the fine print. Or maybe you get that lovely notice in the mail that says, it's time to renew your driver's license. And it's been so long, you're not sure these eyes will focus. And you just missed the window where you could renew it online. And now you've got to go downtown to the DMV. God bless the DMV. It is one of my all-time favorite places to go. I love to spend, especially if I can go on my anniversary or some nice day like that. In fact, I recently had the joy of going to the DMV. Ryan, do we have that picture of how I felt that day that I went? Yep, there it is, right there. That's how I felt. How do we renew ourselves in a world that makes you feel like this? We're going to look at that today because Paul has some amazing insight for us. When you think of renewal, do you, do you need to get away? I know this church. Every time you guys think of renewing, you know where you go? You go right here to the beach, right? You know how I can tell? Because I see it on Facebook. Every given weekend, half our church is at the beach. And if it's not this week, swap it. Next week, it's you. I'm serious. I am not kidding. Y'all, if we ever show up on the same day, 
we will not have room for anybody. It is going to be the miracle of miracles because we go to renew. We go to check out from this world, right? And we see the beach. And why you like the beach? I don't know because it's nasty and sweaty and sandy and gritty and it gets everywhere. And it's just one of those things. But you know what? For you, that's where you renew. For me, it's standing in front of a freezing cold fan in the mountains somewhere with a fire nearby just for looks because I don't want to get too hot. <laughs> we do that. We all have the places we go to renew. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what it means to actually renew our minds. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 or pull up your favorite Bible app if you've got your smartphone. I'm going to read from the New King James today, the NKJV. While you turn to Romans 12, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us today. We pray God's word will speak loud and clear to you as well. Romans chapter 12, let me set the context for what we're about to read, just so you know what's going on. Paul has written 11 chapters of Romans dealing with some incredible spiritual mysteries. He is giving a crash course on deep doctrine and how to live out the gospel. And then something happens when he hits Romans 12. He totally changes, I mean, it's like a bam, doom, new topic. And he shifts gears completely and he launches the church into this crash course on how to live out spiritual transformation. How to be renewed. And it's totally unique. He totally changes gears. You can read the first 11 chapters later, but Romans 12 is so jam-packed with renewal and how to live a life that is above and beyond the, the norm that you see out there in this tired and world that wants to beat us down. This is such pure gold. All right, so with that as our setting, look at verse 1 of Romans 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, and that includes sistren, as you'll see in just a minute, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, what? Renew say it again. Renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Wow. So, so much good stuff here. Right away we see a strange word, because we don't talk like this. What's that second word? I beseech. Say it with me. Beseech. Right? God bless you. Right? It sounds like somebody sneezed. A, what does that mean? You have to go look at the original Greek. It's a Greek word called parakaleo. And it's two words, actually. Para, meaning coming alongside of, and kaleo, to call, to kaleo out, to urge. Paul puts them together, and he has this. It's an exhortation. He is literally coming alongside us and urging us. I picture like a cheerleader coming along with a bullhorn going, you can do it. Y'all remember that scene from um, Facing the Giants? We had that picture of the, the guys. This is so cool where the guy's got to do the death crawl and the coach is cheering him on and Brock's got this football player on his back and he can't let his knees touch and he has to stay up and he thinks he's going to go 10 yards or, or 20 and then be done and take the blindfold off. Oh, no, no, no. The coach gets down on his knees. And he's saying, Brock, I know it hurts. You got to keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. You got this. I can't go anymore. Just 10 more yards. Don't quit. Don't quit. And he is screaming. He's cheering in the crowd. The whole team's standing up. They're on the field. They're like, what is going on? And before he knows it, he's gone the full 100 yards. And he takes his blindfold off, and he's in the end zone. All because he came alongside him, and he parakaleoed. He literally cheered him on and said, don't quit. So that's what Paul is doing for us. He's coming along and saying, I know it's tough. I know it's hard to present your body as a living sacrifice. I know this world's pulling you in a thousand different directions. Don't quit. Not now. You're this close to victory. Don't quit. I am urging you on. He uses this word an astounding 54 times. You think it's important to Paul? I would say so. Don't quit. Hang in there. And he's cheering us on. But i got to ask you, what is he cheering you on toward? Well, the next verse reveals it. To present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Which, by the way, is your reasonable service. Living sacrifice. When I read those words, to me it seems confusing. It almost seems like an oxymoron. Why is that? Because when we think of sacrifices, we usually think of something that's dead, right? Like the Old Testament people, they come, they sacrifice a lamb, put their sins on it, say, God, please pour your wrath out on that, not me, <laughs> right here, you know, you take it. And it's dead. So it's kind of creepy when Paul uses the term living sacrifice. You know why? Because living sacrifices <laughs> tend to squirm 
on the altar. Somebody got it. Somebody. Paul is saying we are to come daily, not to these steps of this altar, but daily to renew our minds. We are supposed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, to daily renew and say, God, I'm not going to do this without you. I make a mess of my life. Will you take, like we talked last week, will you take this lump of clay and fold it as you, the master potter, and only you can? Will you do that? I'm going to renew myself. I'm going to purposely submit myself. See, here's what we do. We come and we lay ourselves at the altar and we give him our selfish desires and our goals and our dreams and he says, I can do better. And then when we think he's not looking, we crawl off the altar. <laughs> Picture that. Right? It's like, I'm here, I'm yours, I surrender all. You are the way, the truth, the life. Is he looking? I gotta go. I got this, I got this agenda. And we crawl right back off the altar. It's supposed to be a living sacrifice where we come and we lay it down. Complete, utter surrender. That is a word that is so foreign to so many believers today. But that's where the spiritual maturity shows up. Where we say, God, <laughs> we're not supposed to be on the altar. Nevertheless, Lord, my will be done. <laughs> it's, I think it's nevertheless, Lord, thy will be done. Where we come to the point where we are willing to submit my desires, my goals, in order to have them align with the kingdom. And it comes down to one word. Surrender. It's not a popular word. You won't hear that preached in several pulpits today. But it is a biblical mandate. This is the time we completely and utterly surrender to God and we bring our thoughts in line with him. You want to be renewed? Be the first one to crawl on the altar every week. Be the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning. May our knees hit the ground. And if not our knees, may our heart hit the ground. Lord, thank you for another day. Let me focus on you. Because I read in your word somewhere that if I seek you first and your righteousness, all these other things will be taken care of. All these other things will be added unto you. And then, as if we need a reminder that this is not an outrageous request for the Christian, Paul goes on and he uses this word that shocks me. He says, this is your reasonable service. Reasonable? Paul, what are you thinking? How is this reasonable? Are you, this sounds like really advanced stuff. Living sacrifice, living my day-to-day -day life, like, like following Christ. Are you sure? Are you sure this isn't just something for like seminary nerds and doctoral students? Because this sounds like really advanced. No. Paul is saying, guys, this is Christianity 101. In fact, he says this, you're reasonable, sir. This is not the outland. This isn't the advanced level. This is the expectation of those who wear Christ's name. Those who say, I believe. That's the reason. In fact, if you look at the Greek, you know what he uses? He uses a word, logikos. Logikos. You see where we get the English word logic from? He's coming along and saying, this is your logical, reasonable duty as a Christian. So I got to ask, how you doing with that? How you doing with your daily renewal? Is this the only meal spiritually you eat all week? <laughs> Man, I hope not. You're all going to be hungry. If this is the only time you, if this was the only time I said I love you was once a year on our anniversary, you think you might be a little, little starved for, for love and attention? This is a daily renewal. So how are we doing, church? Let me encourage us to live a sold out life for Christ, living a life of sacrificial worship. It's our calling. It's not like, oh, wow, look at you. You're spiritual. You get the gold star. You're really doing it. No. It's for everybody who claims to be Christians. This is what we're supposed to do. As A.W. Tozer puts it, he says, worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. We're supposed to be changed with the renewing of our minds and our hearts, and we go out and we live. Look what Paul says in verse 2. He goes on to say, and don't be conformed to this world. We're not supposed to look like them and live like them and act like them and behave like them. But be transformed by the what? renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is the goal right there. 
There it is. This is the goal, to live in that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Who doesn't want that? How awesome would it be for your head to hit the pillow tonight and go, whoo, Lord, thank you. Today I walked in a, a, a way of obedience that was good and acceptable and perfect in your sight. Whew, man, think of the sleep you will have. When you can jettison, I love that line we sang in that, that last song, that, that bridge was phenomenal. <laughs> all my cares, all my worries, <laughs> they can come along. Wow, that was awesome. Because when we're in his presence, those things just flee. They melt away. God wants us to spend time with him to renew that. Now think about that. Jesus got this. Remember, he's the one that kind of instituted this. Don't forget this in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember when he talked about sins like murder or adultery? Guess what he said? Guess where they start? Every one of them. Nothing happened externally before it happened internally. All those sins began with the mind. That's why Paul says, renew your mind. He didn't even say renew your heart at this point. He said, renew your mind. That change, we're supposed to live it out. And it's supposed to be a spiritual discipline to have that mind and our will aligned with God. So how are you doing with that? There's going to be a lot of challenges here today. A renewed mind begins with renewed thinking. Paul uses the word metamorphosis. You guys have heard this. Caterpillars, we, who are caterpillars, aren't supposed to stay caterpillars. We're supposed to mature and become what? Butterflies. All right. 18 of us passed biology. <laughs> if you haven't heard, caterpillars become butterflies. That's how it works. And they fly off. And they're beautiful. They don't stay caterpillars. We are not supposed to stay in our infant state. We're not supposed to be spiritual babies. We're, we're just eating spiritual pablo and Zwiebeck and Ritz crackers and whatever it is these days that kids eat and stuff. And a little hella mama bird chews it up and spits it in my Man, if that's the only meal we're eating, I can't feed you just on Sunday. You've got to be feeding yourself. And I can't just feed myself on Sunday. I've got to be feeding myself. Everything I want to preach has, has to be coming through me, through that, that burning personal experience where it's beat me up all week. And th Thank you, sir, man. Have another. Ooh, that was good. Thank you, sir, man. Have another. That's awesome. Make me more like Jesus. So when I come out of that office, I feel like I'm dripping with the Holy Spirit. And we have something to rally around. And we look at because we have renewed our minds. We're not staying in this infant state. Paul is saying, church, you're expected to grow. So as your friendly neighborhood pastor, how you doing with that? If you had to take out your holy post-it notes and give yourself that weekly ranking, scale of 1 to 10, what number would you slap on your forehead on that post-it note? With spiritual renewal, how seriously are we taking our maturity and our growing in faith? Give you a 5. Somewhere dead set in the middle? All right. Two? <laughs> ten? Woo! Anybody a ten? This isn't a one time thing, by the way. The way he writes this, the original language says this is something we're supposed to do over and over, and it's mentioned in Scripture again and again. He talks about it in Colossians. He says this set your mind on things above, not just the earthly things. Then he goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Did you catch that? Paul is saying it is time for us to put off the old and put on the new. In fact, he goes on to say, I have been crucified with Christ. That's what I've done. He crucifies his own flesh to say, I want to be more like Jesus. Man, that's commitment. That's maturity. Y'all may remember years ago, I had the opportunity to do some revival work with Rick Stanley. If that name doesn't ring a bell, he was the stepbrother of this guy right here in the back. Anybody know who this guy is in the back? The king. Thank you very much. That's right. Right there. That guy right there. And here's Rick. He got to move in. His parents married. Married Elvis and his family. And he became his stepbrother overnight. Got to live at Graceland. Got to grow up. Earned his black belt. Became his bodyguard and everything. Toured with him. God got a hold of Rick Stanley. He became a, a, an on-fire Christian. And I got to hear him share his testimony for a few times. And one of the things he said that stuck with me, like 25 years later, I still remember that. I, I can't remember what I had for breakfast two days ago. But I can tell you what he said. You know what he said? This is so powerful. He said, there comes a time in every man's life when the little boy's got to sit down and the man has to stand up. 
When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So here's where it gets real. What is it that's in our life that God is calling us? What childish thing is he asking for us to give away? When you think through your life, in fact, this is an experience. You could do this right now. You can even just say a quick prayer to the Lord. You don't have to wait till later. Lord, reveal to me anything in my life that is childish that it's time to let go of. And see if he doesn't bring something to mind. For some of you, something flashed through your mind right now. Whether it's a childish addiction, a childish pursuit, or a hobby, or something that has taken the, the throne of God and you've put your idol there without even realizing it. Something you're more excited about than your love for the Lord or mentoring your children in the ways of the faith. Because they ain't getting it out there. <laughs> Look around you, Ellen. We are the cavalry. It's just the church. I mean, does the culture applaud you standing for Christ? Negative. <laughs> And they're not supposed to, because they don't know the Lord. Our job is to live with such love that they want what you have. To love so loudly that they say, man, I don't get that, I don't know, but man, look at how he loves. Look at how she loves their neighbor. Look how they take care of each other. Look at how they just, they can't wait to get together and have this, I guess, a holy hug. I don't know what those weird Christians do. But, you know, they see that because we are just so overflowing with the Spirit. Because we've been renewed, we've been in God's presence. Make no mistake, the enemy does not want us to be renewed. His job is to distract us. Shiny things, he says, look, look over here, look shiny things. No, 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 don't look at, don't look at, don't look at the cross. <laughs> no, look over here, you need this, and you need that, and you need to be over-communicated, and you need to be plugged in five different ways, and you know, I was pulling it, and all of a sudden you just snap. And we don't resemble Christ at all. When our neighbors look at us, what kind of God do they see we serve? Is it one that never lets us rest? Or is it one that gives us that, that peace because we have been connected to him? So here's what I'm going to do. So that we don't get off on these sidetracks and start compromising our faith. Remember, one compromise here, another compromise there of our beliefs. That's what the devil wants, just, just a little bit. Pretty soon, enough of those compromises, we no longer resemble Christ, but we resemble the world. And it happens very subtly. It's very insidious. The devil doesn't show up with a red horn, cape, and pitchfork and go, ha oh, ha, worship the devil. It's not the way it works. It's just a little off track here and a little off track here. Before you know it, you're no longer where you wanted to go. You've somehow been over there. It's just because it's been a little bit at a time. So here's what I'm, I want to give you three steps that you can take with you. Three ways, because God is for you. He wants to provide a way. We already have the victory. It is a matter of us employing the techniques that God has showed us. You already have the victory. So here's the first thing I want to leave with you today. Saturate yourself in godly thinking. If you want to renew your mind, this is step one. Psalm 19 says this, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord my strength and my redeemer. How are you doing with that? How's the meditations of your mind and your heart? What about the words we say? Notice what I, I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not saying read God's word. I'm saying saturate yourself in godly thinking. Where you surround yourself. Where when you read a passage, you read it over and over again. And you say, as you read this verse, God, what does this mean for me in my daily life? I'm not reading for entertainment. I'm not reading. I want the life change experience. I protected this time, Lord. Speak to me. Holy Spirit, be my teacher. He loves to answer that prayer. Don't you, as a father, as a mom, when your kids want something, don't you love to be able to give it to them? How much more our Heavenly Father? This means saturate, surrounding yourself with godly influences, godly teaching, godly friends, godly entertainment. It, it matters what we plug into our head. Garbage in equals garbage out. Just look at your kids, you know? When we let them go, look what they do. We gotta be pouring good stuff, Christian music, Christian movies, anything that lifts up the name of the Lord. And then shut off the stuff that's poison, the stuff that does them no good. Garbage in equals garbage out. Saturate yourself with godly thinking. 
Number two, and I love this one, slow down and unplug. This one's easier said than done. Psalm 46 says this, be still and know that I am God. Be still. You know what? The latest report I said said America has three fascinations. We have three idols that we worship. We don't even know we're doing it. The three idols that we are preoccupied with are size, speed, and noise. Think about it. We always want things faster or bigger or quicker or louder and all these things. And then it's followed by the three things that we fear the most. Our three biggest fears in this generation aren't World War II and doing all It's bad Wi-Fi, a signal that's taking too long to load, or a low battery. Right? True story? This is what we deal with. We are so plugged in. Do you know it's possible to be too plugged in? Maybe it's time for us to put God first. It's okay to say no. Yeah, I said it. You can tell your friends. My pastor said, it's okay. I'm going to politely decline this because I need to make time for the Lord. I am going to turn off my TV. I'm going to unplug my iPhone. I'm going to shut down the iPad, and I'm just going to focus on the Lord. This is what I'm going to do. We are so plugged in, so much hustle and bustle, and all these distractions. And we hear that phrase, don't just sit there, do something. And we bought into that. But maybe God's saying just the opposite. Don't just do something. Sit there, please, so I can speak to you. You want to hear the truth grenade? You ready? All right, here you go. I'm going to pull the pin. Here you go. It is a shame when everybody in the world can get a hold of you except the Lord. That's not a note, man. You need to write that down or something. That is it. it is a shame when everybody on the planet can get a hold of us except our Creator. Isn't that astounding? I can't tell you how many times this goes off. Lord, I'm sorry. I thought you and I were going to have an awesome date today and have some great time, but I got 23 unanswered emails I still got to get to, and it's midnight, so maybe tomorrow. Shame on me. Bad man. This is what we do. So I'm giving you permission to slow down and unplug. Okay? Tell your friends, your pastor said, send them to me. I'll take the heat for you. And then the last one, hide the word in your heart. Hide the word in your heart. Now listen, I am not saying just memorize scripture. Okay? Because all of that is just bad. We, we think, oh, I can't do that, pastor, man. You don't understand. Memorizing is hard. I, my, my mind left me a long time ago. <laughs> I get it. Take a number. We all have trouble with this. What I am saying is what Psalm 119 says. Your word I have hidden in my heart so that I may not sin against you. A word that is hidden in your heart helps guard you against sin and against temptation. This is so true. Every great man or woman of faith that you look up to has mastered this discipline. And what it entails, it's not some elaborate memorization scheme. It's simply picking a passage of scripture and reading it over and over and meditating on it. And saying, God, how does this apply to my life? What do you want me to do? And you read it and the memorization takes care of itself. You don't need anything fancy. Just meditate on the scripture and watch how God begins to hide it in your heart. So there's your challenge, okay? If you need a simple three-step thing, right here. Saturate, unplug, and hide, okay? Those are your three things. That's what I want you to take with it. That will lead us to a powerful renewal. Now, speaking of renewal, I promised you some exciting news. So we're turning the corner, and I want to share with you some amazing, exciting news that God has provided for us to allow us to continue to renew and grow here at PH. So I have some good news, and I have some better news. Oh, I love it, Louise. And then I have some even better news than that. No bad news, okay? This is, this is crazy. Y'all know we have been actively looking and praying for additional space to continue to grow. And I'll spare you the details, but many of you have been praying with us. I've been praying. Leadership team's been praying. And many of you have been on this journey. God, we are maxed out. What do we do? We've launched a vision fund, and we are well on our way. We've made a great start at a down payment for maybe one day a off-site campus that's freestanding, that is completely ours with our land. But we're still a long way off from being able to have even just a down payment. So the dilemma is, God, what do we do with the people you're bringing now? What do we do with this growth? You all may not know this, but just last week, just in the children's church area, while we're meeting in here, there were 43 younglings back there. 43 Padawan learners in the back with their teachers in rooms designed to hold 12. On Easter, 
There were 62 younglings in the back. And rooms designed to hold 12. We do our best. We'll knock down a wall and try to do it. I can't tell you how exciting but how horrifying it is for a parent or a new family visiting and they've got their little scudders and they're so excited they go to check in and they go, oh, 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 no, no, no. (laughs) We're playing sardines? What a fun game. Not for Johnny. And they take it, cover their eyes, and we lose them because we don't have... No, that's an awesome problem to have. I'm happy that, that we're maxed out there, and I'm happy that God is blessing that. But that is something, there's nothing more frightening than watching those people go and watch their face fall because it is no more room in the inn, shall we say. So here's what's happened. Something amazing has come available that has never been available to us before, never in the 14 years until now. An additional 5,000 square feet has come available next door for use, effective immediately. Okay, not the ballet, but on the other side of that. Okay, and I wanna walk through it. 5,000 square feet plus the 12,000 square feet we currently have brings our mission and, and ministry space to, what is that number? <laughs> you all are terrible at math. 17,000, yes, yes, seven, it's, you're safe, you can say it. 17,000 square feet of additional of total space. Okay, now if you're like me and you can't really wrap your head around that, this is a picture of 17,000 square feet. This is a picture of Ryan Wisham's house. Right here. Okay. He gave me permission from Prescott. We can show this. Okay. I'm totally kidding if you don't know that, by the way, if you're not sure who that is. This is, this is 17,000 square feet of space. Now, the exciting part of this, and the part that, I'm cool, that, I'm really, that got my attention, was that this has never been available before. Every time a bay becomes empty, somebody snatches it up because the market is so ridiculously tight. Apex is the peak of good living and the peak of high prices. We get it. And everybody's proud of that. But things do, 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 do. I mean, just ask any realtor how hot the market is and how how tight it is. This came available, but be honest, if this had come available even a year or two ago or three years ago or eight years ago, we weren't in the position financially to even entertain that. We couldn't until now. But here's the exciting part for me. This isn't warehouse space. This is the only unit, actually it's two units together, that is already upfitted. It's already move-in ready with minor cosmetic things like painting and hanging up some TVs and stuff for for small group rooms and stuff. This will finally allow us not to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in upfitting it, but to move in to where we have our own adult small group space. We don't have to rent from the ballet. Yes, you you can applaud that if you want, or you can go in. And did I mention there is additional bathrooms? Yes. And did I mention there is a kitchen over there with like a fridge and and a a microwave thing that I've heard you press buttons and it heats things up and is is amazing in in what it can do and and a sink and all these things. So all our admin and all our offices that are taking up space can finally be moved into one spot with this adult small group space where we can go and we don't have to heat and cool giant rooms that are scattered all throughout the building. Probably one of the coolest things though that this will provide is a chapel, a prayer chapel, a conference room chapel that can hold 50 to 75 seats where we can come and we can have our women's conferences while something may be going on here or we can help out another church or we can do Financial Peace University because bless their hearts those poor people when we did it last time we had 19 people again crammed in a room designed for 12. So we would have space for that. Or people could come, we could do smaller weddings, or or we could do all kinds of of outreach things, maybe a movie night. There's all kinds of things that we could, your HOA, you need a place? Come, let them come to our church. Other churches that need a place that can't afford to rent from us or a 300 seat place. There's so many uses. We could have prayer in there. It's just, just incredible stuff. Embrace yourselves. Did I mention it also comes with over a thousand square feet of storage? Because no church nor any house has ever had, I'm sorry, we just have too much storage, too much closet space, okay? (laughs) Nobody has ever said that. Over a thousand feet, where we can put in shelves, heavy-duty shelves that can hold non-perishable goods, and finally perhaps start our food pantry. Yes? Woo! Or or a library, because it can hold books, those things you can check out from library. Remember that? All these things that... Y'all, we've never, the possibilities are endless because we've always had to think about it in terms of one day when God does this and that, and we just kind of, we'll just keep doing what we're doing for the Lord. But this dropped in our lap at a price that we can stretch and meet. 
And it is something that has come. And this will, by the way, this will give us signage on both ends of this campus where people, I know how frustrating it is to be on the phone in the lobby and you've invited your friends. I'm right here. Turn in. Pot, where's Potter? I don't see Pottery Barn. No, it's Potter's hand. Turn it right. Uh, never mind. You missed this. Turn around and you go back. They can see it from the Walmart side on Apex Peakway now and from the Perry Road. Sorry, okay? So signage on both ends. And it'll look like we own this whole campus, which is kind of cool because they'll probably say, what a nice church, letting that ballet have a little space in their little nook right there, right? And go, of course, because we're Christians, you know? <laughs> All that's exciting. But you know what's the really, really good news? As excited as I am about having an East Campus and a West Campus, I'm excited about what it means for this right here, for our current place. Because of what it frees up for our children and our youth and our teenagers. Because of what we can finally be able to do that we have desperately needed for a while. We, we can always go to two services here if we have to. We can do that. We can cram out a few more chairs. We can, we can sacrifice some round tables and put in more chairs. I know, I'm so sorry. I'm so, oh, do it, do it. I surrender all, but not the round tables, Lord. I surrender. See what I'm saying? The struggle is real, y'all. We got it. We have to be willing to sacrifice just a little bit. What we want to do is we're going to move all the offices, all the admin, all the storage, all the stuff that's here. By the way, did anyone notice the corner of crud has slowly shrank because we've been moving stuff next door? That used to have giant blue barricades that come all the way down. You know how you know how big it was? We couldn't even finish painting the brown stripe in the corner. Look at that. Because there's been stuff there. That stuff now has a proper place thanks to Brenda who is a tornado of organization, and Jason, who's a tornadet of it. He's like the disciple of Brenda and doing incredible stuff. So you're going to see some changes, and I'm going to show you where you come in. As we come, as guests arrive, we will now be able to make all of those children, and we will have hallways that are color-coded. When they come in and say, oh, you have children, great. You follow the purple hall or the green hall down here. If you can't get them to the right room, we can at least get them to the right zone, okay? The kid's zone is that way. <laughs> and God bless you as you travel that way, and we hand them off to people who are trained and ready to receive them. Okay? As they go, they get to walk by now things that we can encourage them. Scripture verses. Sayings that encourage them to know that they're loved, they're valued, they have purpose. And as they go, oh, you have a teenager, a youth? Awesome. Guess what? You get to go down this hall to the youth wing. And as you go, you'll see a check-in spot. Show those kiosks, Ryan, if you see those. Where you can go, and you actually have two or three. Did you know that we actually have lines sometimes on Sunday of checking people in? But because we can now move that office out and take down some of those walls, we will be able to have a little indoor play place. Do we have that? While little Scudder and Johnny are getting checked in, they can sit there inside while mommy's doing this and meeting Leanne and getting checked in. Okay, it might be a little smaller than that, but that was the only picture I could find. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea. It's not just that that's kind of cool. But we are sacrificing a lot of things, including my office, <laughs> my huge, awesome office that we are going to convert to the main children's church room with a stage, with lighting, with flat screen TVs, with sit spots so they can sit when it's time to be still and hear God's word, but also room to grow. They can hold 50 to 60 people in there. They need this. And yes, it will be with a tear that I really wish that now that I've gotten used to having it spoiled. Don't worry, we'll have an office over there that'll be smaller, but it'll be okay. I'll deal with that. We're willing to sacrifice, right? That's my round table. That's my round table. I'm sacrificing right there because it's got its own bathroom. See what I'm saying? So, so I'm, I'm giving all of that up because it's worth it. All kidding aside, if it advances the kingdom, good night. Let's do it. It's surrender. Are we all in or not? So all this is exciting. And it's not just the younger kids. We're talking middle school and high school. We want to be able to convert this whole wing to new space. And I'm talking to a lot of cosmetic stuff and taking down walls. Not a ton of money, but it will be a ton of elbow grease. And we will need your help, which is where you come in. And I'm glad you asked, because I heard you say, Pastor, how can I do? We're all in. We're so excited about God giving us something that's never been available before. We're never going to do. Here's the first thing I need your help with. Okay? And I put it first for a reason. Pray. Please pray. Please, please pray. Can I tell you something? This is fun, and this is exciting, and it's great, but it is tedious work. These last two weeks, we've been hustling, 
just to bring this announcement together, just to take care of the logistics. It's, it's little mundane, tedious things, and all these things, they're draining logistics on top of an already full workload for a lot of part-time staff, for a lot of you in leadership, those who are serving. And I can tell when you're praying for me, and I can tell when you're not, because the attacks of the enemy get through. And these last two weeks have been brutal. They've been tough. And the devil hates this. He hates when churches take more ground away from him. He hates it. Anything that does a good job for the kingdom, he's supposed to rise up like a flood and try to be that barrier. Otherwise, he's a terrible enemy. So he hates this, and that knows we're on the right track. So would you please pray? Would you pray for stamina? Would you pray for perseverance, for uh, energy, for favor during this time? Because we're dealing with a lot of things. Town of Apex, permits, landlords, all kinds of stuff. And we want to reflect Christ through every situation we come encounter with. I've never led something through this. In 14 years, we've never been on this precipice. We've been in this and like this for 14 years. We're taking new ground, and it is terrifyingly beautiful. So I need your prayers. Will you pray? Will you do that? Number two, don't, you're not getting off easy. Give. Your time, your talents, we're going to need them. And yes, your treasure. Many of you are so faithful in all three of these. Most people, dare I say, in this church are already committed to support this church financially. Most of you are already tithing. That's incredible. Most of you know that God gives you 100% of everything you have, and you keep 90% of it for yourself, and you share a tenth of that back as a tithe to the Lord. God bless you. Did you know we could not succeed without that? You're being faithful. Thank you. If you are not, if you've not yet taken that step of faith, may I suggest now is a beautiful time to consider <laughs> doing something. If you're, not, if you're not ready, if you're not at that point of faith that you can step out and do a tithe, do, a, do, do something. Do something. If it's a 50 bucks or 100 bucks a month or a paycheck, just do something and watch how God honors that. Watch how he pours it. If you're a tither in here, you're nodding your head right now because you know it all comes from God anyway, and he blesses that. It's a weird formula. You cannot outgive him. Trust me on this. We need you. Don't be content to just ride in the wagon while someone else pulls it financially. Help us out. Some, it's time. Remember we talked about that spiritual infancy and taking that next step in our faith? Some of us have never gotten out of the wagon. We need you. We need you. We can't reach apex with just us, just a few people. Everybody has to get out and pull the wagon and leave that empty seat for somebody else. We're always thinking about the one who hasn't come through those doors yet. Always. That's how we resist the urge to do this, to become focused on ourselves. Are you with me? Not if you're still with me. All right. So you made it through the hard part. The last one, serve. So today, I've got a clipboard. And afterwards, if you can serve, we have big things and we have little things that we need help with. Little things. Cleaning. Moving some chairs. Redoing the windows. Washing windows. Stuff on the outside. The, the, the new campus down there. And I'm going to give you guys a tour of that. As soon as it's cleaned up enough and the wires are up and, and everything is, the chairs are out of the way and stuff that we've cleared out of this corner, I'm going to give you a tour. You all know I had lunch with the mayor. I had lunch with him last week. And he wants to come to church with us and dedicate the new campus. He wants to come and have the Chamber of Commerce show up with the newspaper and do the big ribbon cutting and a dedication. I'll reach out, I'll see if Pastor Steve can come back and maybe have a dedication ceremony and we'll all walk through it and just have an awe. How cool is that? To be able to, to reach out to our community for somebody like that, that's awesome. So, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do something different. You, you haven't seen this coming and I think I've used up all my time. I'm gonna leave this up here after we dismiss. All you gotta do is put your name, your contact number, how you like to be contacted, and how you're willing to help. We need assembling furniture. We've got some flat screens for the adult small groups that we want to hang, some plasma TVs, whatever, on the wall, LED. I guess I'll get out of the 90s. And we'll put something on the wall there. And Blu-ray, because we have a lot of video lessons. And I, I know the Hope group starting that in June. So there's all kinds of little things we could do. Uh, painting, different things like that. If you're willing, I'm going to start from this list first. Those who have signed up, and we'll reach out to these people as the needs come up, okay? It's going to be all summer long. It's going to be one fun, long, hot summer. And you know how much I love heat. It's going to be fantastic, okay? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and after we dismiss, I want to encourage you to go to the bake sale for five minutes and buy up all those yummies and go by the Ghana wall 
and take an envelope if you haven't done that yet. I think about half of them are gone. We'd love the rest of them to disappear. These got to be turned in in the next few hours, okay? There's something for everybody. All the proceeds of that bake sale go to support our Ghana missionaries, okay? And they leave soon. You can see the dates right there on the wall. So I hope you're praying for them and supporting them. But there's still one other surprise that involves a baked goodie. Many of you know, and if you don't know, Ryan and Jennifer are expecting their first baby. Okay, so yes, we're excited for that. And seeing as how they're, they're awesome people and church is their life and God bless them for it, they have invited you, anyone who wants to, after we dismiss, after we have our five minutes of getting your kids and getting your baked nummies, come back up here and we have a cake. They do not know the sex of the baby. I know. Amy knows because she bought the cake. We are all going to find out together. And they've invited you. When we cut into that cake, it's either going to be blue inside or pink or plaid or whatever. But it's going to be one of those two things. It's going to be something really, really cool, right? And they're excited. They don't even know. Look at him. He's just grinning, okay? They have invited you to stick around and celebrate this moment in their life. This is a big deal, okay? And yes, you get to eat the cake. So I hope you can do that, all right? Let me pray for you. I'll be around. You got your marching orders, lots of stuff. Don't forget the sign-up sheet. In about five minutes after we've gotten our kids and we've milled around, if you can stick around and, and celebrate this moment with the wishes, I know they'd appreciate it. All right, let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we love you. You are so good to us. You have blessed us in ways we don't even recognize. So before we ask you for a thing today, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Hear our hearts. You are a great God. You are worthy of our worship and our highest praise and so much more. God, I thank you for this hour with my closest friends in the world. I thank you for their love for you, for their friendship, for standing with us for so long, and I thank you for what you're going to do. We're so excited. May we be on your path and just get out of the way and watch you work. May we follow after you. Thank you for this incredible time together. We give you all glory, all honor, all praise. In Jesus' name, amen.